Space is always hard for many reasons. Some companies cannot put their vehicles into orbit because their capabilities are not strong enough. In contrast, SpaceX is different. They have the technical capability to ready Starship for launch at any time. However, they're hindered by another factor, which is part of a government agency. This seems to be a complex issue that's persisted throughout the testing and development process of Starship. So, how has SpaceX addressed this challenge? Will there be a second test flight of Starship coming in November? Stay tuned as we dive into this and more in today's episode of Alpha Tech. There is always some degree of tension between companies and regulators in almost any industry. That tension can be healthy as both companies and government agencies seek the right balance between ensuring safety and allowing progress. There are signs, though, of strains between the launch industry in the United States and its main federal regulator. Changes in launch regulations intended to streamline the process may have done the opposite, slowing down licenses as companies seek to expand their launch activities. At the forefront of those tensions is SpaceX. The company is preparing its Starship vehicle for a second test flight but needs an updated launch license from the FAA to do so. Although the FAA recently announced that they have completed the safety evaluation during the Starship and Super Heavy license assessment. However, this does not automatically grant SpaceX the launch license. The FAA is currently engaged in the environmental review process, including consultations with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services about the environmental effects of the new water deluge system SpaceX has installed on their pad. That's designed to prevent the serious pad damage seen in the first launch, but Fish and Wildlife has to examine what impacts that system might have on the environment. A Fish and Wildlife Services spokesperson said that once it receives the FAA's final biological assessment, it has up to 135 days to review it. That piece is a little bit of a wild card, Kelvin Coleman, the FAA's Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation, said, but was optimistic it wouldn't take nearly that long. We're hoping that piece will wrap up somewhere in proximity to the safety review. Clearly, the scheduled launch date for Starship in the first week of November is off the table. However, the work continues, and the efforts this month remain a cause for concern as SpaceX closely collaborates with the FAA and undergoes the investigations by Fish and Wildlife. In recent times, we have seen Fish and Wildlife Services officials consistently entering the Starbase facility after each SpaceX test of the water deluge system to assess the environmental impacts around the launch site. There are still no signs indicating when the results of this assessment will be concluded, and the scheduled Starship launch dates approaching closely. To be honest, from all that Starship has to contend with, we can also observe the stringent regulations imposed by the U.S. government on space activities. This may impede the progress of ambitious missions and their technological advancements. In fact, SpaceX is not the only company facing challenges with regulations. Other companies have run into the problems with a new streamlined launch licensing regulation called Part 450, which took effect in 2021. The regulations were a response to calls by the industry with the backing of the Trump administration through Space Policy Directive 2 to make it easier to demonstrate meeting safety requirements through performance-based standards rather than more prescriptive protocols. That has not worked out in practice, at least so far. Karen Schenewerk, president of CS Consulting and a former executive with SpaceX and Relativity Space, noted that only four Port 450 launch licenses have been issued to date, and at least two of them exceeded the 180-day review period by the FAA established by law. Recent changes in the FAA regulations have not resulted in streamlined licensing reviews, she concluded. Instead, Part 450 has proven more cumbersome and costly. While well-intentioned, the Part 450 effort has not succeeded in accomplishing the streamlined process, Bill Gerstenmeier, Vice President of Construction and Flight Reliability at SpaceX, and a former NASA official noted in his prepared testimony, AST's ability to process licenses in a timely fashion has declined rather than improved. Indeed, as evidenced, by licensing for the handful of applicants under Part 450, approval timelines are not improving. Wayne Monteith, a former FAA Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation, said in his testimony that the result to develop the Part 450 regulations may have contributed to the problems implementing them. Based on the short development timeline, industry involvement in the regulatory process was severely limited, he wrote. Because of this compressed schedule, some constructs within Part 450 were not as thoroughly vetted as would have been ideal. That's further complicated by an increase in launch activity that's straining AST's workforce. 
Difficulties in implementing Part 450 regulations only exacerbate this workload, said Phil Joyce, Senior Vice President for the New Shepherd Business Unit at Blue Origin. The problems with Part 450 extend beyond launch to re-entries, which are also covered by regulations. Vardis Space Industries has been working with the FAA for months to get a license to return a capsule on its first satellite, launched in June to test technologies for pharmaceutical production in microgravity. That license, the first Part 450 reentry license, has not yet been issued. Dilian Asparov, co-founder of Varda, said in an interview last week he could not say if the company would have already gotten a license under the old regulations. The company also has to work with the Utah Test and Training Range to identify when that Air Force run range can now support a capsule landing. I feel confident that if there had been 10 previous Part 450 reentry operations, it would have gone much more smoothly, he said at the licensing process. Witnesses were unified in their call for additional resources for AST to allow them to hire more staff. Gersten Meyer argued for doubling the budget of AST, currently less than $38 million a year, provided the additional resources go into handling licensing. He warned of dire consequences if regulations aren't approved and more resources are allocated to AST. But as AST transition licenses for vehicles previously approved under legacy regulations to Part 450 over the next two years, the entire regulatory system is at risk of collapse, he wrote in his prepared testimony. AST's workload over the next 12 to 24 months could result in the grounding of U.S. space launch capability if action is not taken immediately. Any increase in AST's budget would be welcome news to Coleman. The first thing we focus on, and we have a big focus on this during the course of the past year, is really trying to make sure that we have the requisite staff on hand, hiring and bringing the talent pool in that we need in commercial space to keep pace with the industry, he said. He attributed the issues the industry had with Part 450 to the growing pains of new regulations. It's not only challenging on the government side, but on the industry side as well, he said. The transition to Part 450 will last until 2026 when all existing licenses under old regulations have to convert to Part 450 licenses. As we get more experienced and as more companies get more experienced, I expect us to really see the full benefits of Part 450 come to the forefront and see some nice games from that, he said. That tension, though, about regulations and the speed of licensing will continue for some time. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has publicly complained about the slow pace of licensing at the FAA and posts on the social media network X, which he acquired last year. Coleman, though, noted in an interview last month that after those comments, Musk visited FAA headquarters to discuss Starship licensing, meeting with him and FAA leadership. It was a good conversation, he said. I think the relationship's working pretty well, but there are some challenges, of course, that we have to work through from time to time. Even Musk said as much. In fairness to the FAA, it is rare for them to cause significant delays in launch, he posted last month. Overwhelmingly, the responsibility is ours. That's all for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please let us know what you think in the comments section below. Your feedback is very important to us and helps us make better videos for you. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.